<laughs> and so if you need someone for a, uh, a three-month contract uh, to uh, do Y2K compliance, so I'm like, sure, I can do that. Um, one thing led to another, and I, and I moved to Boston. This is the first time away from home or whatever, done through and the um, well, um, and I phoned in the Y2K stuff and made a spreadsheet. Um, uh, and I eventually got hired, and, and this was an extremely lucky moment for me. It's not only that I probably not deserve the job, um, but it was an awesome place and an awesome time to be working at that place in terms of uh, distributed systems and systems. Um, so uh, after Akamai, I was at Apple for a little bit, multimedia, Basho for a long time. Um, and now, I, about a month into it, I've got a Twitter and a storage team um, where I work on the Manhattan database. Uh, so the paper itself, sort of a meta note on industry papers. Um, from what I can tell, conferences are, are more willing to accept industry papers than the industry. Um, so if you work at a company uh, that you feel has a novel that you need for a cool architecture, um, and, and the powers of being the company don't want to publish and stuff about that, I don't think people need to worry as much as they used to about whether there's a novel that's resolve um, uh, contribution or intention as long um, as, it, as it reflects uh, the, the, the nature of the system. something that people weren't sure if it was going to work out or not. Um, I mean, there's, there's a million other uh, things about 99 that were, that were crazy. And, and we were in the middle of this insane uh, IPO bubble. So an interesting time to be, to be starting a company um, around distributed systems. So, why CDNs in the first place? We take CDNs for granted nowadays. They're practically just a layer of the internet, part of the really core internet, internet infrastructure that are just operated by um, private companies that don't happen to be during Velcro companies. Uh, so why, uh, and, and for a little more historical context, you know, we didn't have YouTube yet, um, but we had Napster, and people were just starting to get a taste of like, oh my god, all these uh, free MP3s. Uh, uh, bandwidth still sucked, broadband was not ubiquitous, um, but it was good enough to download like a Led Zeppelin, pirated Led Zeppelin box set. Um, and people were starting to get ambitious. There was a, uh, and I remember we always used to use this in early uh, in my marketing material, uh, Victoria's Secret had to do a fashion show on the internet during the Super Bowl once. I don't know if anybody remembers this this last year, but it was like this 20 by 20 animated GIF that like only like 300 of the people, what the millions of people who tried to see it uh, could see. Um, so Akamai, one of Akamai's pitches was like the Victoria's Secret fashion show would have been way more badass if, <laughs> if you funded us. Um, uh, so. But again, we're still dealing mostly here with a read-only internet, uh, one that largely of static content, not a lot of interactivity. Uh, there's no social media. Uh, there wasn't hacker news uh, to tell you to tell us at Akamai 
how we were wrong when we were designing the system. It turns out you can do a good job without all those idiots. Um, <laughs> there wasn't there wasn't Twitter for your friends to tell you in a more sarcastic, subtle way how you're wrong. Um, and, and we did just fine. So all right, that, that's enough about uh, 99. Uh, one, this is one of the sort of the main big reason why the internet sucks for the kinds of demands that we would like to put on it. And it's, it's how the internet works once you get past your home router um, uh, and a couple of hops to your ISP is, is peering. Uh, and this is the mysterious world of BGP. Um, you do a trace route from one host to another, and you see it go through IP addresses. They're all speaking the same protocol. Um, but uh, to facilitate that, there's a very complicated relationship uh, in a protocol called BGP. Uh, and it's a very complicated relationships among uh, peering providers, Cogent, Sprint, uh, Level 3, et cetera. Um, that makes that all work. And these uh, uh, different providers will communicate with each other and basically share what IP addresses can be reached by running traffic with them. Um, the problem is at, that, at these peering points, uh, there are politics, because these are different commercial entities that sometimes compete with each other. Uh, lots of human error in these configured routers. Um, and they're a pretty uh, DDoS target if you want to knock geographical um, or sort of organizational regions uh, off the internet. Uh, they're called autonomous systems, uh, and they're not very smart about how they route traffic. Uh, basically, BGP will choose paths, will choose um, what route to send things on based on the, the, the number of a autonomous systems, the number of these little clouds here. Uh, that, a, that a packet has to go through with no uh, consideration to whether that actually translates to the real world throughput or, or latency uh, improvements. So it's, pr it's pretty dumb in the, in the middle mile, as they call it. Um, and we had a division of people at Akamai where it was just we had to hire these certain people because they were the BGP politics people. And God knows what they did. Um, but they leverage their connections to make sure both that we got favorable curing arrangements um, and, and that uh, you know everything you know would end up good for our network. They would help head off disputes between partners who might be on the verge of messing with each other's peering to send sort of political competitive messages. Uh, but you can see how critical this this part of the internet is. Um, you might remember some of these. Pakistan tried to block YouTube. And basically, black hole YouTube routes and the way that NCAST works. Basically, all of YouTube uh, was was offline for a couple hours to a day in various parts of the world. Um, so there's a sort of security issue if, if Pakistan on its own can poison the system to the level that it affects availability for sites elsewhere and outside their control. Yeah, kind of messed up. Um, a little later that same year, Sprint and Cogent had some sort of billing dispute, and Sprint de-peered from Cogent, which uh, caused just about like the, the basic, or basically the biggest network partition in history. Uh, a lot of people were single home behind Sprint. A lot of uh, organizations were single home behind Cogent. Uh, and any of those would uh, have experienced uh, serious uh, outages. Um, NASA was single home behind one of them. Uh, a lot of big websites, uh, a lot of government agencies in, in other countries were, were single home behind one of them. I think 3,500 networks in all uh, were affected because uh, a couple white guys uh, got mad about, about money. Uh, that's counter to like me always being able to refresh my tweets or, or load animaticus. Um, there's also, I, I wouldn't necessarily call them problems, the internet didn't, wouldn't work if things weren't this way, uh, but there are barriers to getting uh, what we need out of the internet to support what we want to do on the internet. So TCP is a reliable and great, beautifully engineered protocol, 
But uh, modern use cases like streaming and highly responsive uh, interactive web applications uh, kind of go to crap over that middle mile. That's just the, the mess I described before. Because TCP's built-in uh, flow control mechanisms will do retransmits and, and slow start uh, in the presence of high latency and packet loss, which happens a lot. It, you know, in the, in the middle section of the internet where you go through all these peering devices, um, and that breaks, you know, all the all the cool things we want to do uh, with the internet. So that's the, I mean, that's a, that's the core reason why uh, we need content to the free networks uh, is that the internet is uh, is great, but on its own can't really support even in 1999, uh, let alone today with mobile and everything, the type of apps that people were demanding. So enter Akamai. Brief system overview here. Uh, so this is a typical CDM re request path. Literally every website you go to, probably literally, literally every website you go to does something like this with some sort of CDN. And they all roughly work the same, but in this case, this is, this is Akamai. So we go to Inez's profile uh, on Twitter.com, and that serves back some HTML, uh, where all the large objects, images, and media uh, are served under this A420. Or there's a number of different numbers you can put here. Uh, Akamai controlled domain, uh, and then some other crap, and then the name of the file. So then your browser says, OK, what is you know, akamaitech.net? Uh, that gets mapped to sort of a high level uh, DNS server. It's sort of a two stage mapping process. Um, that mapping system basically delegates uh, the DNS query and, and eventually the actual HTTP request to uh, an edge region, which is a, plus, a cluster or a couple racks or single rack of machines close. Um, to the user, and there's varying definitions of close that are used in different contexts. Uh, and then that server either has it in the cache, and due to some of the properties of the system, um, there's there's a, a great likelihood that it has it uh, in the cache. Uh, or if it doesn't, it fetches it from the origin server over the transport system, which I would call the internet, except that's the, the middle little circle here. Um, I would call it the internet, but there's various overlays uh, that Akamai uses uh, to avoid, again, the same problem with, with the middle line. So um, some of the design principles. And these are going to seem familiar. Uh, well, as I was writing this talk on my plan, a lot of this stuff sounds like the React talks for many years. But then I remember, like, this is where I learned all that stuff about React. So, um, and this is sort of an interesting one. How distributed does, does this kind of thing need to be? Uh, and Akamai's answer is, is hella distributed. Um, <coughs> I'll explain. Uh, so the, the sort of Google, Amazon, I guess Microsoft model is huge data centers in, in a handful of locations with hundreds of thousands, millions of machines uh, in each. Uh, whereas Akamai chooses many, many, many different regions with a smaller set of machines. Uh, when, we, when we still use the, the, the wrong pronouns with past companies, um, when I my first started, it was a win-win situation. And it still is, I think, to some degree, although there's been a lot of consolidation of, of uh, a number of providers. But uh, a local ISP, we would send them servers for free because their users get a better experience because they're served right from the local ISP at one another mile. And the local ISP saves on upstream bandwidth costs because of that same caching. And all they've got to do is rack some servers, which we remotely manage, and, and they can stay hands off. Um, we did this at universities uh, as well. And eventually, Akamai grew a very large footprint, uh, but not in the sense of, again, Google or Amazon. Uh, to much more distributed in the sort of physical, geologic, uh, geographical sense. Um, so the result of this is that 
how come my servers are closer to the user than even you know AWS servers that probably have to go through more little mile um, uh, hops than something right in your ISP or on top of web. Uh, again, also increased availability because there's less stuff to break in between you and the user. Both good things. The trade-off, and indeed this this happened, <laughs> uh, was <laughs> uh, much uh, a hugely increased complexity in, in the design of the system and the operations. But we'll see how that eventually paid off. Overlay networks. Um, do you remember when Steve Jobs used to do the keynotes and brought by Streamum over quick time and everybody was watching? That was uh, Akamai's thing. We had a pretty cool relationship with Apple. We built the original music store for them, um, which came in handy when I wanted to go work there. Um, actually, we made that. We made a quarter once for them. They were gonna they were gonna post a loss for the quarter, but they sold all their Akamai stock and were profitable. So much love. <laughs> um, this was Akamai's first experiment, uh, experiment with this sort of uh, putting a virtual layer uh, on top of the existing internet. And these are all, you know, distributed system con concepts, sure, but it's also sort of the classic notions of, of layering and layers of indirection that you see in software of all different skills. So, you know, this comes from the patent. Uh, uh, a diagram um, where the source might be Steve, well, would have been Steve and Cupertino talking about maybe an iPod back then, um, uh, and some local equipment that's sending streams out to multiple Akamai uh, servers for a first layer of redundancy. Uh, it says splitters there, we call them reflectors internally. Each one of these reflectors would then take that stream uh, and break up each little chunk into UDP packets and send each little chunk over one, two, or three alternate routes, uh, or two, one, two, or three alternate servers um, uh, in case it, they occur packet loss. So you could always sort of reassemble the stream reliably uh, at the edge here, where these streams were then uh, all aggregated back in and, and served uh, to end users. Uh, at first, we wasted a lot of bandwidth just always sending three streams. Eventually, when we got a nice feedback loop performance data, it would send one, two, or, th or maybe three, depending on actual sort of within the last minute conditions of the route that it meant to do. I'm not going to let my care mat come out here, but I already have by saying that there was care mat that could come out the wrong. Um, uh, we got we, we sort of doubled down on this uh, towards the end of my career there um, by so we said okay this looks cool for like RTSP streaming video why can't we do the same thing with with IP uh, so I wrote this little prototype of this thing called SureRoute IP that basically is very simple. Um, reads packets off a, there's this thing contact you can do in Linux where you can read off a network interface like it was a file. Uh, and then sends, does the same thing with those streaming reflector systems today. It breaks each TCP packet up into three UDP packets and sends them over three distinct routes. Not internet routes, but this is sort of source routing, right? You know. Uh, including the route and the message that it's supposed to take over any number of Akamai edge servers, uh, only to be reassembled uh, at whatever the endpoint of that TCP connection is. Uh, so here's an example. Um, and we didn't realize how big this would be right away because we were only testing it in the US and Europe. Um, it wasn't until we started testing it in Asia and seeing some of the conditions over there that uh, we realized that this actually had um, some big potential. So I, the way it basically works is Akamai has all manner of boxes that are pinging each other, pinging customer endpoints, pinging significant parts of the internet and uploading that data uh, for analysis to various central locations. Uh, so if you're a customer, uh, you know, with a location there and a location here, uh, 
what we do is we, we, we ping your locations from various places on the internet, and the minute that we find out that we can do better than the regular BGP routed political corrupt internet, um, we, adver we, we just take your route. Much like Pakistan took YouTube's route and broadcast it to nowhere, this is a, a useful sort of BGP thing where we say, okay, now this route that corresponds to the, the place your TCP connection is trying to go goes through this Akamai machine where the you know, splitting of packets happens and uh, sends across three routes. Uh, they're assembled all back at the at the uh, edge site, so you can see here. I mean, Akamai marketing material, but I think it illustrates it okay. Uh, we would have this knowledge. Um, you know, this path has a hundred millisecond delay. BGP has some congestion, so it's two hundred milliseconds, and this other path is um, one hundred twenty-five milliseconds. Um, so Akamai would choose the shortest path. This was great for. Um, people working um, with things like Citrix, where you needed uh, responsiveness, um, and we found a ton of uses for it later in our own platform um, after the fact. Uh, so, more on that in a bit. Interesting uh, story about about developing this. I don't. I didn't know the graph algorithm they were using to process all this stuff. Uh, a lot of working at Akamai was um, taking uh, some Perl code that some PhD wrote and, and converting it into a production service. Um, so uh, that, that, that kind of happened a lot. Uh, <laughs> the, the original problem, though, is we thought we couldn't read, by the, we thought that by the time that we finally pushed, we finally reacted and pushed the change out that the problem could have healed itself. But it turns out as you as some of these congestion problems are, are not that transient and you can actually get some benefit here without a lot of flapping back and forth. Um, so this is sort of an example of where that uh, you know choice to go with a lot of complexity and a wider uh, spread paid off because if we didn't if we only had central pops everywhere, we wouldn't have edge servers close to people wanting to establish these types of optimized TCP connections. Uh, so that, that paid off. Um, they can also, it can also do some, some crazy stuff. Since we control the whole path, uh, we can tell if the host would, uh, one host was going to do a retransmit and send a retransmit. Uh, from the middle of the network, if we chose to be stateful like that, we optimized a lot of the pessimistic sort of constants in the TCP protocol to adapt to the fact that we knew a lot of these network conditions. Um, at the time, 60,000 servers, those would randomly sample some low-level kernel stats about the TCP connections, and they would all feed into uh, the big mapping process um, that drove the decision-making in all of this. So, to get into the components a little bit, um, there's a lot of components. Uh, I'll go through them uh, in greater detail in a sec, but some of this illustrates the stuff I've been talking about uh, already. Uh, you know, your end users talking to edge servers, edge servers talking to origin servers, which is, you know, Twitter.com, the actual website that serves Twitter.com. Um, a storage system, which which I may be able to get to, might not to, might not get to. Um, monitoring agents everywhere, pinging, gathering every type of uh, statistic that you can imagine, and DNS, which plays sort of the central part. You know, uh, the DNS is basically the hash function mapping uh, a, a, a user to a server. Um, uh, but, but in addition to that, we had a sort of uh, epidemic-based communications and control protocol to get quick updates out to as many machines as we could. Uh, a pre to do pretty large scale with data and log collection architecture. Um, eventually, we got banks uh, and e-commerce sites to trust us with their SSL sites. Not that it matters now. <laughs> um, at the time, we thought we thought that was a big deal. Um, 
Uh, but, and we had to do a whole bunch of stuff to get that trust. We built this thing called Camera Bond. We had any, any rack that has cell certificates on it had a motion sensing camera on it. And the, the idea was that if anybody was screwing the server, it would take a nice screenshot of them and then we'd call like, facility security. But it was always like the fat UPS guy bumping the. It was always a picture of someone's ass like, <laughs> uh, carrying servers down, down the rack. I don't know if we ever caught anybody through the camera mount. Um, uh, but in order to do that, we did have to build a public key management infrastructure, which is always the mythical missing piece of, of why crypto can have a large scale. Well, within, I won't get into that. Um, uh, which was a cool system, a bunch of Postgres databases replicated with Paxos. Uh, pretty cool for its time. I remember, when did anybody remember when the Paxos made live paper, or a pet chat for that? Like, when did the Paxos make simple paper come out? The late 90s? Or when did the Paxos come out? 99? I don't know. It was, it was soon after people, like, very few people compared to nowadays started caring about Paxos, and I remember not knowing what it was and hearing in the hallway, you know, a conversation among engineers where some like, yeah, we're going to do that, the, the Paxos stuff, and the other engineers, you know, oh, I don't understand Paxos. So. <laughs> Before I even knew what Paxos was, I knew it was hard. <laughs> um, uh, installation and config management, which was uh, what I worked on for a while, basically DevOps, before they called it DevOps, um, is, it could be the subject of a whole talk. Um, and a really unique, at least for its time, uh, monitoring and alerting infrastructure. So uh, the Edge server platform is basically the, the caches that your browser actually talks to and the sort of supporting infrastructure. Um, it was originally a, a pretty heavy, heavily modified split cache. Uh, from what I know, they've, they've rewritten it now, and it no longer has any squid code base in it. Fun fact, the AGPL was a reaction to us not contributing stuff back to squid. Um, uh, the behavior uh, of these edge servers, of these proxy caches, um, uh, was controlled by the, the metadata service, which is a whole separate paper about uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about it. This had things like access control lists, um, custom behaviors to apply for certain URLs, custom HTTP headers to add, basically per customer configuration of the proxy cache. Um, and then it, within that edge region, uh, several layers of fault tolerance. There was, um, for, for services that ran in the region, there was leader election uh, for individual edge machines. Um, there was IP-based failover techniques. For a while, we just had a, a buddy machine sitting idly by that would, um, if it detected the other one was down, would send an ARM message and sort of real-time take over for the other one. But we, we, we made that a little less wasteful as time went on. Um, so that's, you know, as the sort of HTTP serving bits that are sitting in a Nakamai region in your ISP. Uh, the mapping system, which is really sort of the, the secret sauce, um, the, the diagram for the mapping system covered a wall like about that size. I don't think anyone ever fully understood it. You could call it a microservice architecture nowadays. <laughs> Back then, I called it a mess. Um, <laughs> so this is, uh, you know, how that DNS-based hash function, consistent hash function, which I'll get to, works. Um, we're constantly collecting all this sampling data, performance data, historical data, uh, and just basically making um, maps of the internet. Uh, as far as its architecture, it was just lots of leader elected services running with them in the data centers. Um, but there's, there's sort of two phases to it. There's a, a map that's generated periodically, um, which basically maps or equivalence classes of IP addresses to Akamai region from, um, and it expresses, you know, the cost of going from one to uh, And then that scoring map feeds into the real-time mapping system, which is actually state that the DNS servers have that uh, 
act in real time to decide what response, what IP address to give you whenever you look at an optimized uh, hosting. Um, so yeah, real time mapping uses the scoring map. It also uses live data from what's going on in the internet and, and manual overrides. Uh, in the case that we're doing DDoS prevention, there was a plan. DDoS is a White House one, so we blacked out a bunch. We used our internet spread to sort of black hole all the traffic, and that's an example of a mapping override. But this is the two level sort of hash function here. Um, so when you first look up that, you know, a420.g.akamartech.net, uh, Post name that you'll find that you find in a web page that has optimized content, uh, you hit what a uh, top level name is there. Um, and that maps you to a region, which again is a rack in a data center, a location. You know, if we were, um, uh, let's see, say some corporations have but if we if we were at Stanford, Stanford probably has a region. Um, so uh, one interesting sort of heuristic is that you could almost always assume that the DNS server that issued this lookup is close to the user network-wise, unless, they, unless they've screwed up their settings. So it's usually provided via DHCP uh, by them. So that's a useful approximation of, of, where, uh, uh, of where the user is network-wise. Top level name server delegates then the request to the region that they're mapped to, uh, where there's a machine that's actually going to serve the request. Um, and this is where it uses consistent hashing. And this this used to be the hardest thing to explain uh, when talking about how Akamai work, but now just imagine Cassandra or Reoc or any database, distributed database that uses consistent hashing there. Um, and what we got out of that was, you know likelihood that the data was going to be there if it had been requested before. Um, perfect or optimal spread, optimal spread of utilization, storage utilization and resource utilization across all the machines in the cluster. Um, and a degree of resilience uh, in the face of machine failure because only a minimal amount of data. If the machine fails, then uh, you know, sort of different from the database use case, if, if the data is not there, you can just go back to the origin. Um, and then for all this, DNS TTLs were set appropriately low so that users would see, see changes in, in the system. The top level TTLs were higher because that data changed less, less often, but the, the low level TTLs were on the order of like 20 seconds. Um, so the, the original, and you can find this in a paper, uh, an early paper about Akamai, they originally wanted to use some Netscape specific extension auto configuration to do the, the consistent hashing on the client side. And DNS was like a, a trade off, but I think actually a really elegant way to, to do it. So even smart people like the original designers say stupid stuff sometimes. And, but anyway, yeah, so consistent hashing is everywhere now. Shout out to React. Everybody's probably seen this diagram before. Um, in 1999, it's, it's, it's uh, hard um, to overstate how much this was viewed as secret sauce. I mean, the company, beyond having a lot of smart engineers and, and good leadership and, and very good timing, um, was largely an algorithm, which I think is kind of unique uh, even, even to this day, with maybe the exception of Google and, and PageRank or whatever. Uh, so the metadata service uh, was basically how all the machines got their configuration. The, the, the stuff I mentioned before about customizing cache behavior, but also configuration for sub-services that weren't we were facing. Nowadays, this would be a Zookeeper cluster. Um, uh, but it was a sort of novel quorum-based replication uh, system. Somewhere essentially from a network control center, you send an XML file to this thing, and uh, eventually it gets out to them. Uh, it doesn't go out to them immediately, though. There's some automatic sort of phasing to test for um, poison configs that was implemented after uh, a particularly devastating uh, <laughs> poisonous config that got pushed out. Uh, there's a very interesting paper on this. Uh, the URL is at the bottom here, and I'll, I'll put a URL for these slides up uh, when I'm done. Um, 
but yeah, this this is uh, for those of you that work at you know modern service web companies. This is the big global zipper cluster. I hope that's an effective <laughs> metaphor. Um, really cool thing, and I've I've raved about this before, but uh, the query system is real time relational database with SQL distributed across all the machines that Akamai had. Um, when you were writing a component, there was just a simple API uh, for you to provide basically tabular data about the state of your component. And that's all you had to do. Um, the, the larger query system would first, at a regional level, aggregate all the stuff from their machine, from machines in a region, and then send it up this sort of tiered hierarchy until it finally got to what we call the, the aggregated machine, where you could literally tell it to it and write you know, something like, Select star from machines where uh, CPU, you know, where load average is greater than five. Um, tip, like actual queries were much more complicated than that with joins and the whole SQL uh, syntax, um, which is nice because it enables ad hoc queries and it doesn't mean you have to sort of reason about what you need to alert for before you actually run this thing in, in production. Um, you know, there's also, uh, you know, this is a quote from the paper, the, the declarative expressions of system invariants. Uh, you know, you should say it's a, it's, it's a self-zero issue if more than 30% of our top-level uh, DNS servers go down. And that's a very simple SQL query. And the, the whole thing that drove alerting at Akamai was just writing a SQL query that shouldn't return any rows if everything was good. And writing it into a web UI, um, and then specifying a, you know, it was our own little page duty thing, right? We, had, we didn't have any of these nice services. But that, you know, they always say SQL is for managers. And in a way, that, that's sort of true. It sort of democratized the ability to, to alert on, on various conditions. Uh, also, very interesting paper on that. Uh, it's in this talk, and it's also in the tech pub uh, section of the Akamai website. Uh, here's here's the cool uh, part. So, where did we leave off? I had gotten hired out of a trash can, right? Um, I get there, and uh, they're like, we, we we thought we had. They didn't call them rock star developers back then, but you know, we we thought we had great developers and they needed the best equipment. And that meant big monitors. But uh, they didn't have LCDs back then. These were 21-inch 21, 21 inch big Dell CRTs. Like, I, don't, I probably couldn't lift one today without breaking my back. And we were hiring like 100 people a day. Um, so I'm like, sure, you know, basically lugging monitors around and trying to snip in on engineering conversations um, as much as I could. Uh, one time I lugged a monitor to Justin Sheehy, uh, and we started talking about aspects of how we manage the network. Uh, and I was in IT, that was called the deployed network, and we were not allowed to even think about it. Uh, and I really wanted to, to, to mess with it. So uh, I convinced Justin to sort of, uh, Justin and others, to like, get me out of IT and into, into systems engineering, DevOps. Um, uh, and this was, this was really cool uh, and, and scary as well. So there was no chef or puppet, not that it probably would have been better with either of them, but. Um, <laughs> Um, the way we described the network was just an enormous text file uh, that listed every machine and the services it ran and all sorts of other stuff uh, in Perforce. I miss Perforce, by the way. I'm gonna, it, I'm bringing, I'm gonna bring back Perforce. Maybe. That's an aside. Though. Um, Push-based deploy uh, of all the software, you know, from a central location. When I started in the systems engineering group. It was sort of the last of the one-person installs uh, before we got our act together and made it so that it could be handed off. Our stuff, uh, you know, the instructions I got were like, do this, and if the query doesn't return this, call Rahul. Uh, and then, like, Rahul doesn't answer, so, like, what the hell you do, right? Um, so it took me, I mean, installs are starting to take, like, 12 hours. Um, so I, I didn't have to do that many of them, but I was lucky enough to say, Justin and I write the software that made them take less time. So push-based deploy, sure. 
uh, that seems uh, untenable for that many machines, but when what you have is a CDN that can cache all the all the software artifacts, it's, it's actually not that bad. Uh, and installs are basically constantly happening, no impact. Um, this is, I think people can achieve it, people do achieve this nowadays, but what the, soft, what the install software would do is just build up a whole parallel root file system, diff it, um, different files were known to belong to different components, and then for what it changed, you'd ask the component what to do, and it all magically worked out, or didn't, and if it didn't, it didn't matter, um, because of all the distributed great stuff. Um, Log collection was another one. Um, we used SMTP. And people always laugh when I say this, but when you think about it, like it's on your whatever Unix machine already. It's got local durability down pat. Um, it's got retry mechanisms that if that, you know, are gonna get your email there eventually with a higher probability than using some newfangled, you know whatever the latest message queue is, I don't know. Um, uh, but you, you, know, you can't care, you don't, you don't get to care about latency or ordering, but if you, if you don't have that, those restraints, it's the way to go. Um, so logs are emailed, I shouldn't have said origin host, I should say edge host, but every server just basically up, mails its HTTP logs up to the central, um, I almost said Hadoop cluster, it wasn't a Hadoop cluster at all. Um, uh, fun, uh, fun fact, the log rotator was the first project I had when I got to engineering. Um, and it was probably the most complicated log rotator ever because when you have a, a, a scarce resource like disk space and ever-growing HTTP logs and the possibility of um, and, and various values to the company of those logs, um, the, the log rotator had like a constraint solver in it. It was pretty wacky. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, so once uh, they they all get mailed to the the central billing data center, uh, probably something that looked like MapReduce, but it was just a bunch of Perl scripts. It's probably better too. Um, uh, and then they were inserted into the whole only relational database I ever saw in production at Akamai, which was the big Oracle billing thing because it had to be. Um, so that was log collection. But I, they they probably uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they used it. So that's really the, the architecture uh, and the system, really. But I, I had some sort of reflections as I was thinking, of, you know, as I was writing these slides, uh, and I got pretty sort of nostalgic about my, my first job. It was really the sort of first commercial distributed system as a service. You can you can nitpick about other things. We had competitors that were previous to us that we that we crushed. Um, uh, so it was it was a huge undertaking. Um, I think consistent hashing is sort of these once-in-a-century once discoveries, inventions, uh, just because of the number of, of applications. Uh, that also led to the sort of core CDN business commoditizing very, very quickly. Um, one thing we missed out on as a company was on like open source and uh, talking to developers more. I mean, when was the last time you were thinking about a project and said, oh, Akamai was going to like, save me a lot of time? No, not really. Uh, newer CDNs like Fastly that can, that can do really quick, like immediate purging uh, can have a, a more significant role uh, in the des early design uh, of, of a system. Um, I started making a lot of noise about this before I left. I remember Google's first, very first, the very first thing Google open source it was like 100 lines of Python that had some functional programming utilities. Um, and I could just, nobody could ever get Akamai to sort of believe that that was uh, a, a wise thing to do. Um, the landscape has changed. Uh, competitors now mostly use the Google, Amazon, Facebook, you know, many, very you know, fewer, very large data center models. Um, and when you measure them, they're, they're, you achieve almost parity uh, among, unfortunately, at least like people who buy things, you achieve parity. Places with crappy connectivity, Akamai will beat it, but for um, 
the people who eat, who you know, American e-commerce companies care about. Uh, all the CDNs are basically on, on farms. So how can I get some crap for just going too crazy with uh, distributed systems? And Bashel inherited some of that that crap too. And and maybe it's true to a point, but as I mentioned before, without that unique spread out architecture, you couldn't do cool things as effectively like those IP networks. So trade-offs, right? Um, uh, the principles and, and a lot of the people behind Rick and Basho came out of, of this whole thing. Uh, Justin, myself, two of our founders, Tony and Earl, were uh, executives there. And the, the uh, focus on ops and maybe the sort of uh, pedantic to a fault focus on distributed systems correctness that Basho sort of has as a cultural value came from Akamai. And I didn't talk about this, but um, one of the founder of, of Akamai, one of the founders of Akamai, Danny Lewin, uh, was actually on Flight 11 when, this is a real shitty way to end a talk. I'm not going to do it anyway. I didn't think about that. <laughs> um, uh, he was on Flight 11. Um, and if he was around today, he, I mean, you would know his name. I mean, screw Jeff Dean and um, Sergey Brin and anyone, right? Like Danny, um, uh, you know, we really lost the, lost the hero there. The irony and what made what uh, made that really amazing day in even a positive sense for Akamai was that uh, all the communications infrastructure that got damaged on that day. Um, and all the demand for online news just brought everything down, basically. And we gave out free CDN to a whole bunch of people. And the only way people got news that day was because of the invention that that uh, that, that Danny made and, and turned into a company. Um, so shout out to Danny. Um, and that's it. Uh, I hope you know. I hope I. Uh, went through the material of the paper without the unfortunate marketing stuff. I might have picked another one if I realized it was that marketing from the beginning. Um, but I'd love to answer any questions you have, and thank you for coming. Uh, did you ever prioritize routes based on how much it cost you to send traffic over it? Like, Absolutely. <laughs> what, what did you say, like, we have a peering agreement with X that's like, I don't have to pay any money, whereas if you do this, we have to go through uh... Yep, and there's a funny story about that. Um, uh, I wasn't there. Uh, a couple of the early engineers were at Yahoo. Uh, they were an early customer. Um, whiteboarding the architecture out. And one of the, Bruce Maggs, I think he's the Carnegie Mellon professor, Works out, and here's the choice where we can act either maximize or either minimize our cost or your cost, basically. And the business people are like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, one of the many measurement axes was um, was was cost, absolutely. Um, especially like after the dot com bubble crashed, uh, and we started to care how much money. Uh, we were spending. <laughs> yes, we found out all sorts of other ways to, to to use the same stuff to you know to put costs into the whole uh, uh, decision making. Anything else? Sure. Yeah, you were talking about your multiple uh, solution. Uh, I couldn't quite hear, but I said something about keeping it from rain. What was your solution on that spot? Keeping you your solution from rain? Because like I mean you're trying to make a you're you're sending some packs to the network going, hey, it's a better. I'm gonna like drop a bunch of traffic through this ah, node. Yeah, I wanna yeah. make sure I don't like they don't load that node and bring it back to it. Oh right. Um so I, if I get the question correctly, it was it was about the whether we were unsure if the IP overlay network was going to be effective. Yes. Because of the amount of time the feedback loop took from uh, performance agents gathering data sending it up to a big uh, central system that did an exhaustive, expensive, uh, transcribed from Perl by me graph algorithm uh, on the data, push new configuration out via the metadata system, that configuration arrives at the edge system and then advertises the PGP route that essentially started putting the traffic over the 
um, uh, Akamai overlay, if that amount of time is longer in the average case than the amount of time these uh, peering problems, internet congestion is in the average case, then it doesn't then it doesn't pay off. Um, and two things help that eventually be viable. One is that we use some of the more real-time communication channels we had um, to make that uh, feedback loop faster. Um, and once we tried it out in areas that actually had more of these connectivity problems, uh, the payoff was much more obvious. But for a while, I would watch, you know, uh, it would be sort of a race and what, you know, we were simulating bad conditions and then, you know, like, come on, you know, switch over, switch over, switch over, uh, and it and it would miss it. And so what you'd end up with was just flapping back and forth, which didn't help anyone. Um, but that's, that was, yeah, and I wrote the data. I wasn't responsible for making it, actually. <laughs> sure. How did you write the tests? Wow. I'm trying to think if we had any unit tests at all. <laughs> Some stuff had unit tests, although it's definitely closer to the no unit tests at all thing. Um, we had test networks. Um, we had phase deploys. Uh, we had a, a degree of accountability in that for each release, if you change something, you know, we'd install it to a machine, one machine first, then one rack in a data center, then striped across many racks and many data centers. And at each one of those phases, you're responsible to, to check something off. Um, and the theory was that you, that you got an earful if you, if you screwed it up. Um, service companies, I don't know. A, a lot of the service companies I know of value, you know, value the ability to, to either divert small amounts of traffic to new stuff uh, or have granular controls over turning like feature flags, turning things on and off, and being able to quickly improve the service over uh, some notion of quality based on testing uh, in, a, in a local environment. Um, but I don't think I ever one unit test while I was there. Did you, did you have like tests? Or environment simulators that yeah. have the over data. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We had we had um, uh, lots of test networks and a whole QA department as well. Um, um, but worked out mostly. I mean, we had we had a couple big screw ups. Um, we found out you push a production config to uh, a test network and forget to change the HMAC keys that you use to communicate to the metadata system and then watch all Akamai traffic, which I think still remains about 20% of the internet, uh, watch all that traffic get routed to like 192.168 addresses. Um, we did a big pause and uh, focus on resiliency after that. Sure. Um, for the, the videos again, did you ever run into a problem where the amount of time that it took for, because when, when you replicate to another node, you have to fill up the buffers, right, the other node, and it takes like an unfriendly amount of time before somebody can actually be getting a video from the... Ah, right. We did this thing called pre-bursting. Ah, yeah. Um, and that's, that was one of the key streaming metrics. The question was uh, latency in the distribution channel for video adversely affecting the user experience watching optimized uh, video feeds. But we had the system for shoving a bunch of data in there first to get the buffer filled up and, uh, and then backing off. So that might be a case where we didn't start off with three streams and really try to go fast and then back off to just what was needed to maintain the So you, you basically like use a bunch more bandwidth than you actually needed right. preemptively and then prune back. Right, exactly. Uh, did that end up being really expensive? Um, probably. I mean, it was probably it, we we had a we have eventually had a pretty good handle on our costs, especially using the overlay network, cost optimized uh, and, and stuff. It, yeah, it was expensive. Bandwidth prices were 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 crazy back then as well. I think Akamai's first price was fifteen hundred dollars in megabit a second, 
1999, that Earl Gallagher, uh, my bachelor co-founder, just made up and people started paying it. <laughs> <laughs> Very different bubble than then today. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely, I, I, I hope I described it right, but we definitely um, took measures in software to make sure that we could reverse them a bunch of, of the stream. So like, I, I didn't really have any context about like what a CDN was internally like, until I read the paper. So, so it seems like it was a very formative time for you because like, it exposed you to like, holy shit, distributed systems at yeah. this scale like, are, are real too. Where is the ball now? It's like, what, what are the challenges? Like, is the problem of like, getting content like, solved and then now it's just about speed? Or like, where exactly, where is the boundary you can push? That's an interesting question. Um, I remember the 90s, late 90s being all about, well, the internet's not fast enough to do, to do yet. There doesn't really seem to be anything nowadays that we're waiting for the internet to speed up so that we can do it. Um, uh, the problem, however, is, I mean, we can watch our Netflix just fine in HD, and do we need more speed than that? Uh, the, the problem is, is when the entire world switches to watching Netflix on HD. Uh, then you get into some core internet architecture problems um, that can probably, you know, somewhat be addressed by things like Akamai, but but might need to actually sort of re-architect some of the internet itself um, to support effectively. So I think the big problem now isn't uh, use cases that you know individual internet users want. Like I want to be able to watch video or, or stream high, higher quality music, but allowing more people uh, all over the world to have that same experience. Cool. Can I give a little pitch? If you like distributed systems, uh, Twitter's hiring. Um, uh, you can check out jobs at twitter.com and, uh, and come work with us. Um, yeah, I can't really say anything else. <laughs> um, if you like working on services, if that kind of optimized stuff seems cool, we can pick up the same kind of stuff. So thank you guys so much. I love talking about Akamai. <laughs>